Well, I would encourage you, if you've got your Bibles handy, uh, to do a couple of things. First off, keep your Bibles handy, because we're going to be jumping around to a couple of different uh, spots here this morning. We're, uh, we're going through some topical discussions here during the month of August uh, that are based off of uh, frequently asked questions or common topics uh, in the church at large today or even in our own community right here at First Congregational Church or in our wider uh, region in Bunker Hill and in Southern Illinois. And today uh, we come to a topic about truth and ignorance and apathy. Truth is worth knowing. So today we're going to take a look at the truth of what God's Word has to say about how we worship God. We're going to ask some questions, and we're going to learn about what God has told His people through His Word. Today I hope and pray that God will teach us, uh, and that He will grow in our hearts His desires to become our desires. So, as I said a moment ago, we're going to move through different parts of God's Word in worship. Uh, one of the spots that we're going to end up on is Revelation 3. That's what's printed for you in the bulletin. But our first passage that we're going to jump to today is actually in Exodus. So if you jump to the front of your Bibles, you find Genesis, and then you, then you go to the right from there, you'll find Exodus chapter 20. That's where our first reading is going to be from this morning. Let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll dive into uh, several passages this morning in God's Word, taking a look at his truth regarding the worship of our God. Let's pray. God, would you spare us this morning from uh, willful ignorance, from clapping our hands over our ears, or from allowing our eyes to become tired or apathetic, or we simply don't care? Would you give us ears to hear from your word and from your spirit this morning? Would you spare us from hearing a word uh, from a man this morning? And would you allow us to hear your word, the word of God, this morning? Would you move in our hearts such that your desires and your ways become our desires and our ways? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first place we're going to start today is, uh, is Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, we read the Ten Commandments. Have you all ever heard the Ten Commandments before? <laughs> yes. We'll see who's still awake and who needed to go to bed earlier last night. Alright, there's some of us needed to go to bed earlier, but some of us are still awake. In Exodus 20, we're given the Ten Commandments. We are told God's expectations, God's desires for His people. In Exodus 20, we read this, God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What we read in the commandments of God, in the Ten Commandments, we read a reflection of God's character. A reflection of God's character. When we disregard a command from God, we miss out, we disregard a part of God's character. If we intentionally miss out on a command, then we're intentionally missing out on a part of who our God is. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, as we're told in Colossians 1. Dismissing a command of God is doing a disservice to our Lord and Savior Christ. When we refuse to follow a command that Christ himself obeyed, we say, yeah, well, obeying that command wasn't that big of a deal anyway. We have uh, little children in our home. <laughs> some of them are hungry this morning, some of them are antsy, some of them are focused. <laughs> Some of them are on another planet. <laughs> we have little children in our home and they love to play. When some of our children are gathering together and playing, and one of them decides to assert themselves as dominant, we have words for this. We describe this, don't we? Or maybe this is just my house, maybe it's not your house. But we would sometimes call that being bossy or being selfish. When one child asserts their dominance and says, 
You aren't playing right. Play the way I tell you to play. It's saying you will obey me. I dictate how we play. It's a fundamental change in the nature of their relationship. No longer are they siblings. Now one of them is master and one of them is servant. As God reveals himself through his word, we have an opportunity to worship truly or worship falsely. We have an opportunity to worship God with respect to who he is and what he's done, or we can be bossy and selfish, placing our own desires and priorities above his. In the first commandment, we see God firmly command that he alone is to be worshipped. We see that in Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. The God who delivered ancient Israel from Egypt claims exclusive rights on the worship relationship of his people. Just like how a spouse claims exclusive rights to their spouse, any wandering in that relationship is a violation of that relationship and brings about a great calamity. When God's people place other things as priorities over God's word and God's ways, we commit the same great calamity. In the first commandment, we see God teaches people who is to be worshipped. In the second great commandment, we are taught how we are to worship our God. That second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or the earth beneath, or the waters below. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, you can turn there with me, that's to the right of Exodus. You'll go to the right, you'll find Leviticus, you'll find Numbers. And then the fifth book of the Bible is Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. They, that means the first five books. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, that's where we're next going to be looking at, we find a repetition and a restatement of God's law, specifically the Ten Commandments, to his people. But there's an additional historical recap that is added. In Deuteronomy 4, starting in verse 10, we read the following. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when, you, when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens, with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sounds of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Notice the emphasis that gets placed in Deuteronomy 4. In our family worship this week, on the back of your bulletin there, you'll see our song, of course, is to sing the doxology. We're asking you to pray for the diaconate, the board, and the staff. And then we've got six chapters of God's Word to read this week. We're encouraging you to read Exodus 19 and 20, which describe this exact scene that we're getting a recap of here in Deuteronomy 4, with the lightning and the storm cloud and God's visitation to his people and giving them the law. In Deuteronomy 4, the emphasis is on how the people experienced God. In verse 10, we're told the people stood before the Lord. And God said to me, that's Moses speaking, assemble the people before me, now that's God speaking, to hear my words, God's words. Notice it doesn't say not see my instructions, not follow my visual aids, but to hear. The people were to gather so that they live in the land and they teach them to their children, to hear what they have been told by God, and then to repeat what they've been told, to teach it to their children. The Lord says he spoke out of the fire, and that they heard the sound of words, but they saw no form. There was only a voice. The second commandment is then restated with this emphasis on the no form or no image. Again, that second commandment in that list from Exodus 20 is restated here in Deuteronomy 4 in verse 15, we read, you saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make yourselves an idol 
any image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman, or like any animal on earth, or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground, or any fish in the waters below. In this way, we see God prescribing through a description of how worship is to be, how worship is to look. It is to be devoid of images of God, or representative images of God, or representative images seeking to capture or visualize any aspect of God. It is the word of the Lord that continually comes to God's people, absent of an image. In the second commandment, we see God teach his people how worship should be shaped. God gives instructions regarding how affection is to be shown back to God. In the second commandment, God forbids images from being used as objects of worship. Made images cannot capture God. Not in a photograph, a sketch, a painting, a movie, or a television program. God instructs His people in how His people are to worship Him. I need to emphasize here this morning to you, brothers and sisters, I've had to rewrite this three times this week. This is not today the personal preference or the personal hobby horse of Jacob Toman. We are reading and seeing from God's Word here, God's instructions. This is not my hot take. This is not my approach. This is the Word of the Lord coming to His people in Scripture. Now we've got questions. At least I do, as I've been trying to wrestle through and think through this this week. And I assume as soon as we talk about this, you'll have questions. One question we might have at this point is, does this commandment prohibit all art from being made or used during the worship of God? In other words, it says right there in the text, don't make an image. Should we never make images? Do we need to go out and have a cell phone photo burning party or something? Do we need to destroy art? Should we throw the baby out with the bathwater? The answer is no. There certainly is art that is used in and around the commanded worship of our God. Some of you can take a collective sigh of relief. When God commanded the tabernacle to be built in Exodus and the temple to be built in 1 Kings, he gave instructions regarding the art that was to be used. There were cherubim and ornate decorations and pictures and varying designs and shapes that were all a part of the places of worship. Art is a part of worship. Yet in the art, God is particular. God never commands his people to make an image of himself. That is expressly forbidden. Thus the second commandment allows for artwork in general, but it forbids artwork to be made to represent, depict, or imagine God in an image. What about Jesus, you might say? This is going to get awkward really quick for a lot of us. What about Jesus? Are, are images of Jesus also forbidden in the second commandment? I would simply ask you, is Jesus God? If that's the question on your mind today, all right, we're, we're not supposed to make images of God that's expressly told to us. Well, what about Jesus? Well, is Jesus God? We're told in John 8, 58, as Jesus was responding to a crowd, he said that he knew Abraham. And this is something of a bit of a historical problem, at least for the crowd that's around him. Because they say, you're a young man. Abraham lived hundreds of years ago. How did you know Abraham? Jesus responds by using the very name of God that was used by God to Moses during the meeting at the burning bush. Moses said to the Lord, Who shall I tell the people has sent me? God responds, Out of the bush. No, God is not the bush. His words come forward from the bush. Moses didn't worship the bush. He listened and obeyed the words that came out of the bush. God said, Say that I am has sent you. Jesus, in responding to that crowd about knowing Abraham hundreds of years ago, he says, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, some of you who are aware of English grammar 
all of you here today, I can testify faithfully, are better at English grammar than I am. All of you are. If I gave you my sermon manuscript, you wouldn't be able to read it. That's how bad my grammar is. And yet, we see a grammar moment here in Scripture. If Jesus was referring to a historical reality, he should have said, before Abraham was, I was. But that's not what he does here. He intentionally uses poor grammar to call attention to using God's personal name. To call attention, claiming that he and the same God who Moses encountered are the same. He says, before Moses was, I am. The crowd in that moment knew exactly what he was claiming. Is, is Jesus claiming to be God? Well, the crowd in the moment, they responded by accusing him of blasphemy, claiming to be God, picked up stones, and were ready to off him. So they at least understood that he was making a claim to be God. The crowd knew exactly what he was claiming, and they responded as such. John's Gospel in John chapter 1 makes a huge claim regarding Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then what happens later on in that beautiful preamble to the Gospel of John? And the Word became flesh. And it dwelt among us. When Jesus was on trial before the leaders of the Sanhedrin, we're told in Mark 14 that he was asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? How did he respond? I am. When the wealthy young ruler came before Jesus, he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responded by bringing up the question of his divinity. The man wasn't asking him about his divinity. Jesus made the question about his divinity. He said, no one is good except God alone. Why do you call me good? Then Jesus, in responding to the question, begins teaching about the kingdom of God. Only God is the ruler in his kingdom, and only God in Christ Jesus could speak with authority on the kingdom. The testimony of the disciples in the New Testament was that Jesus was worth worshiping, that he was very God of very God. When Christ Jesus ascended into heaven, we're told in Luke 24, 51, while Jesus was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him. The testimony of the disciples was that Jesus was to be worshipped. These are not men who are worshipping a separate God, a new God, a different God. These are men who grew up as Jews and who read and would have been read to Deuteronomy 4, as we have been read to today in Exodus 20, and Deuteronomy 6, which says the Lord our God is one. The testimony of these disciples was that this Jesus was God. He was worthy of their worship. They knew who to worship, and they also knew how to worship. And these disciples, as they were inspired through the Holy Spirit to write the New Testament, they never give an instruction for making an image of Jesus. Nor did they ever describe Jesus in such a fashion as to be depicted as an image or an idol. In John 14, Philip asked Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus declared that he and the Father were one. To make an image of Jesus is to make an image of the Father. Colossians 1.15 tells us that the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the image. We have no need to make an image, brothers and sisters. We have no need to make a representation of God in any visible means. God has already provided for us the tangible, visible, real, risen Lord Jesus Christ. That's the testimony of the apostles who saw Jesus and walked with him. They proclaimed his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. 
They proclaimed it by speaking rather than by drawing. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, in Romans 10, 17, said, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It is through hearing the Word of God, not through art or visual aids, that the Gospel goes forward and the true worship of our God is found. So we're confronted with some options. We can either deny that Jesus is God, and keep our images, or if our confession is that Jesus is indeed the Lord of creation, very God of very God, then we must rid ourselves of images seeking to depict Jesus. We might have another question at this point. Why would God forbid us from making images of Him? Why would God forbid us from using images in worship of Him? I mean, don't they help? Don't they give us something to look at? When we pray, or when we ponder, when we close our eyes. We have such a good and gracious God. Not only does He tell us to stay away from dangerous things, not only is He like a parent who instructs the child not to play in the road, but when the child kicks and stamps and says, I like playing in the road, why can't I play in it? God also gives us why. He not only tells us what, but He tells us why. The why is that images don't help us in the worship of our God. That is what his word says. We sometimes think images are a bridge that get us through our difficulties in worship to the reality of God. But the reality is, is rather than being a bridge, images of our God are a barrier to true worship. Rather than knowing the Lord via the means he's instructed and provided, we substitute and we create our own means. Those means do not lead us towards a true knowing of our God. They lead us to a false relationship and a false knowledge and a false worship. Images used in worship through both the Old and New Testament are never advocated for. Never. It is always condemned either as idolatry, in other words, either having the wrong person or the wrong God being worshipped, or it is condemned as false worship, the right God being worshipped, but worshipped in the wrong way. Either the one being worshipped is false, or the way in which the worship of the true God is happening is false. When we bring images into the worship of our God, we go against God's word. The scriptures both in the Old and New Testament condemn the use of images, either as being the object of worship, objects in worship, and representations of who we are in worship, or visual aids in how we worship. Alright, I'm going to try to attempt to break the tension in the room at this point. My wife and I like to play board games. Some of you know this. I'm glad you know this now, and not before October of last year, otherwise we might not be having this conversation if you knew just how big a nerd I really am. <laughs> when I play a board game with my wife, it is a good thing, and I enjoy it. I'm in relationship with my wife. Imagine with me for a moment, if I were to say, I love playing board games with my wife so much, that I, I'm going to have a cardboard cutout of my wife made. <laughs> and the next time I play a board game, I can set the cardboard cutout on the other side of the table, and I can set up all the pieces and, and have this representation, this image of my wife with me at the table. The image can represent and can mean to me, it can have some meaning. You know, I might say the cardboard cutout helps me remind me of my wife. Or maybe it reminds me of some aspect of her, the goodness of my wife to play a game with me. All of us would say probably two things. First off, I need some serious help. <laughs> and then secondly, we would notice something else. We would notice that the cardboard cutout isn't my wife. The cardboard cutout has no life. My wife is a real person whom I'm in relationship with and can share activities with. My wife has a will and desire. She has strategy and cunning. 
Be careful when you play games with her. <laughs> the cardboard cutout has no will, no desire, no strategy, no cunning. The cardboard cutout would not truly represent my wife. It wouldn't show all her range of emotions, all her abilities and wit, all her ups and her downs. The cardboard cutout as an image is a shallow thing when compared with the real thing. Now, my wife has not commanded that I don't make images of her. But God has, and we can see why. When we make images of God, we replace our true relationship with God with a cardboard cutout, even if it's a beautiful cardboard cutout, even if it's a wonderful work of art, a masterpiece by all skills and techniques. It's still something that is lifeless, something that has no will, no desires. As an object for us to remind us of our God, these things fall grossly short and reveal that our God is not the true God. What about when we pray, Jacob? What about then, we might ask? We close our eyes when we pray. Who am I supposed to think about? What am I supposed to think about? What am I supposed to see in my mind's eye when I close my eyes to pray? We have some practical help with this. We just went through and spent the summer in the Psalms. Yeah? In the Psalms, we are given so much descriptive language of creation and of experiences of what God's people, as they sang and prayed back to God, what it is that they saw and what it is that they experienced. And yet, in the Psalms, there is no depiction of God. There is no commandment or no image through which the psalmists worship. They pray to God, thinking about what they were praying about and thinking about what they were praying for. When we thank God for His mercies, we can think of times in our lives where we've experienced God's mercy. Some of you this week have experienced that very tangibly. When we thank God for His creation, we can think of the most beautiful sunrises and sunsets and scenery that we've ever been blessed to see. When we pray to God asking for forgiveness, we can call to mind all the ways and instances in which we've been sinful. Oh, Pastor Jacob, that's going to get awkward. When I'm confronted with my sin, I'm going to weep. I encourage us, go back and read the Psalms. The psalmist wept when he was confronted with his sin. The prophet Isaiah, when he met with God, he recognized that he was a people, he was a part of a people of unclean lips, and he said, Woe to me, I am undone, for I am of a people of unclean lips. He recognized his sin when he was confronted with the presence of God. Now, I'm not asking us to start having emotional weeping parties during our prayer times together or during worship. But I do want to encourage you that that is not a wrong thing to experience. I don't want to encourage you as you pray in secret, as you close your door and you pray in secret, not to pray as a Pharisee would so that way everyone can see you in your emotion and in your weeping, but go to God in prayer on your own. Some of you have told me we live in Bunker Hill, everything's 30 minutes away. You've got time to pray as you drive. Keep your eyes open during those prayers. You're driving. You can look out, you can see who is it who makes the corn to grow. It is our God. Who is it who gives us the rain and the sun? Who is it who's made the very fields that we plow and we sow upon? It is our great God. When you close your eyes and you pray, think about what you're praying about and think about what you're praying for. When we thank God for His forgiveness, we can recall His promises in His Word and the promise of eternal life. We can pray to God petitioning Him on behalf of others. We can think of them. When we pray for one another as we're in the hospital or having a hard day, think about that person. Don't think about what God looks like in that moment. You're going to God and bringing that person's concerns with you before the throne of God. In your mind's eye, think of that person. Recall that person, your relationship to them, their circumstances, and your heartache, and your desires, and your hope for outcomes, and bring those before the Almighty God who hears our prayers. When Aaron, the high priest, and many other high priests after him, 
once a year went into the Holy of Holies, the meeting place of God. They only went in once a year. It was dark. The Holy of Holies, as it's described, was dark. There's no light. There's no images. If there was any place in all of the geographic history of God's people for there to be an image of God commanded by God, it would be in the place where God's people and their representative go to meet with Him. And that room was dark. No image. In fact, they had to tie a rope around the high priests because the law was that the high priest could only go in once and once a year. And so they would tie a rope around the high priest so if anything happened to him when he was inside the Holy of Holies, they could pull the body back out without going in themselves. Some of you might be bringing rope to next week's sermon. <laughs> if there ever was someone to commission art of who God was and what he looked like, if there ever was someone to do that, it would have been Moses. He who was in the cleft of the rock, and God's glory passed him by. Yet God did not allow Moses to see his face, but just his back. And when Moses came down from the mountain, what did he carry? Did he carry a picture? <coughs> he carried words. He carried words. Not a picture. Not an image. Not a piece of art. It wasn't because they couldn't make art. It wasn't because they didn't have the tools. It wasn't because they didn't have the technique or the skills. Moses was on the top of the mountain meeting with God. Where was Aaron? He was at the bottom of the mountain making a golden calf. They had the artistic technique, the ability, the resources to make art. It wasn't because we're more advanced than they are that we should make images of our God. The reason why Moses didn't commission a piece of art was because God forbade it. And it was best for God's people for them not to worship God via an image. If you've never worshipped God before, except with the help of images, then I welcome you, brothers and sisters, to take hold of the true God by faith. It is by faith that we walk and not by sight. If we're walking by sight, then we ain't walking by faith. If you must look at something to help you here in worship, then I want to encourage you. If you must look at something, I am very privileged in the capacity that I am because I have the best seat in the house in this regard. Look at each other. If you must look at something in worship of our God and in thankfulness to Him, look at each other. Look and see how God has provided. Look and see how God has provided children. Listen and hear as they cry and as they make noises. Look and see how God has provided sarcastic teenagers with all their hormones. <laughs> and God has got you through the same period in your life. Look and see around you the testimonies of God walking with his people. Yea, though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this week God has provided for his people. You need a reminder of who our God is and what He does. Look around you. Don't make an image. It's so fake. It's so much more shallow than what our God is actually doing in our midst. In your lives. Among each other. Look to each other to see what God is doing. We're witnesses of God's great mercy and the realities of God's grace experienced. If you look around this room and you don't know anybody who's a living witness of God's great and grace and faith on display, then I want to challenge you, you might not know the people of this church as well as you think you do. Invite somebody over. Have a meal. And the stories of God's grace will pour out. At this point we might have another question. Are there consequences for making images of the Lord and worshiping God via images? You bet. In Exodus 32, if you've got your Bible with you, go ahead and flip over to Exodus 32. That's to the left of Deuteronomy 4. So go back to Exodus 32. We read the instance of the golden calf. We 
we read of what happened while Moses was at the top of the mountain receiving the law from God, what's going on at the bottom of the mountain. You know, we often think of this uh, story about God's people worshiping a false god, and we often think of this story as a violation of the first commandment, that who it was that the people were worshiping was improper, that that's where their sin was. It was who they were worshiping. But as we read this today, I want to challenge you and encourage you, as we read this today, take note that it's not only who they're worshiping that's a problem, but it's how they're worshiping that's a problem. I hope this blows your mind today as much as it did my mind this week. Starting in verse 1 of Exodus 32, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, let us, let us make gods who will go before us. And as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing. Bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. At this point, we're all willing to say, well, they're worshiping false gods, right? That's what it says. They're worshiping false gods. It's who it is that they're worshiping that's the problem, not how. Let's read the very next verse. Verse 5 says, when Aaron saw this, so when Aaron saw the worship going on, what is it that he said? He built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. That is not a mistake in your translation, that it is all caps there. That is the personal name of God. We cannot get around this reality in Exodus 32, that not only are we forbidden from worshiping false gods, but we are also instructed in how we are to worship the true God. That as they made the golden calf, they said, these are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. They attributed to an image that which only God had done. Images aren't just about who we worship. It's not just about I'm looking at an image and my heart is in the right spot. I'm thinking about God. It's also about how we worship. But Exodus 32 tells us it is the personal name of the Lord that is used in this event of worship, in this event of false worship and idolatry. It's a scary thing to see the emphasis that's placed here, to see what it is that God warns his people about, not only about who we worship, but how we worship. We're very arrogant in, in some ways, in other ways not so much. We look at a story like this and we say, well the problem was that they made a cow, if they would have made it just a better picture. <laughs> you know, what a bunch of ancient idiots to worship a cow. Brothers and sisters, they weren't worshiping the cow, they were using the cow as a visual aid in their worship of the Lord. The cow at this point in time, in culture and in history, was a symbol of prosperity, was a symbol of blessing, and even a symbol of fertility. Now these are all good things to praise our God for, for prosperity, for blessing, and for fertility. But the way how we go about it matters. The way how we go about it matters. The people took and made for themselves an image which would emphasize or highlight some aspect of God and then praise Him for that. There were consequences. There were serious consequences to this use of a visual aid. About 3,000, you could, if you wanted to, continue reading Exodus 32. About 3,000 died within a day of this incident. And then the Lord allows a plague to come among the people because of the golden calf. In fact, Moses has to go before God and plead to even allow any one of the people to survive. God is a jealous God. Rachel is another example. Rachel is a, one of the wives of the Old Testament patriarch Jacob. She was one of the mothers of several of the twelve sons who later become the twelve tribes. Rachel was a woman who cried out to the Lord. She was a woman of prayer. 
When her womb was closed, she went to God and cried out, asking for a child, and he gave her a child. Yet, she stole some of her father's idols. And we don't hear about her again later on until her eventual death during the birth of Benjamin. In 2 Kings 18.4, we read about the snake on a staff that God had used as a sign of his anger and mercy during a plague that ancient Israel experienced during the days of Moses. Hundreds of years later, that staff became a visual aid in worship. The people were told burned incense to the staff. The burning of incense was something that was commanded to be done when the people of God were meeting with God in the tabernacle or in the temple. Again, do you catch it? It's not that the people were worshiping a staff. It's not that the people were praying to a snake on a stick. They were using something as a visual aid to represent, to channel, to focus on, to look at in their worship. The problem isn't who or what we worship. The problem is how. God has stated how he will be worshipped. The Lord allowed much disturbance to come among the people in 2 Kings with a great upheaval, with war, with famine, all due to their false worship that was in violation of the second commandment. Another question at this point we might have is if we aren't supposed to use visual aids to depict God in worship, then how do we worship? What should we do instead? In John 4, in that moment when Jesus was with the Samaritan woman, during one of my first uh, sermons here with y'all, we talked a little bit about this passage, about Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus met with this woman and he said, A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We worship in the spirit and I hope in truth holding fast, holding tightly to God's word. We worship God in the ways that he has said to worship. Our relationship to God is not mediated or bridged by objects to look at. We worship in faith. We worship that which we do not see. And so by faith we walk and not by sight. I've said it earlier, I'll say it again. If we are worshiping by sight, then we are not worshiping now by faith. <coughs> when Jesus had risen from the dead, Thomas doubted. He wanted to see the Lord. He said in John 20, verse 25, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then what did Jesus tell him? Jesus gave him a blessing. He gave him a word, which is for us. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Another question that we might ask. What's going on in this picture? We've had this light box here for a long time ago. If anybody knows who this is, I'd love to know who it is to get it back to them. I don't want to yell at them. I just want to get them back to their heart. Um, we might look at this art, and we might say, okay, what's going on in this art? Is there anything really that's that big of a deal? It's a piece of art. Come on. What's the big deal? Or any other pieces of art? What's the big deal? The picture in and of itself seems harmless enough. Well, some have said this is a picture of Jesus standing at the door of the human heart, seeking to enter the life of the individual. Some have said this picture is meaning that the human heart can only be opened by the human and since there's no handle on the outside of the door. Some have said this is a helpful picture to remind them of Jesus and his humanity. The original artist had a phrase from Revelation in mind when making this image. As we wrap up here today, turn over to Revelation chapter 3. This will be our last passage that we jump to today. In Revelation 3, we're told about a letter that is written to a church in Laodicea. And it's in the midst of this little mini-letter written by Jesus to this church in Laodicea that the phrase comes to us that was used by the artist to render this image. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's the phrase. 
Laodicea was in what we might think of as modern-day Turkey. And as I read you this letter from Revelation, I want you to see where Jesus is, what door it is he's knocking on, and what's his disposition towards those on the other side of the door. Let's quickly read from Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. All right, so who is that? Who is the ruler of God's creation? It's a Sunday school answer. Jesus. So this is a letter by Jesus. These are his words. He continues in verse 15. I know your deeds. He's saying this to the church in Laodicea. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and wear white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you notice the position of where Jesus is at? He's not outside of an individual's home. He's outside of the church. The church has strayed so far from Jesus. Jesus isn't on the inside of the church anymore. Oof. I hope we are not the church of Laodicea. I don't think we are. But I hope we never go that route. This picture shows us huge gaps and the untruth that can spread when we make images of our God. The scene in Revelation 3 isn't about Jesus coming peaceably to a home or coming to a dinner party as a guest. The scene isn't Jesus hoping for appetizers. It's Jesus earnestly, genuinely, calling out to his church. He knows the problems of the Laodicean church, and he knows their deeds, and that they are neither zealous nor dutiful. They're neither cold in their duty, nor are they hot in their zeal. Their deeds are apathetic. They could not care less. In their religion, they are lukewarm. They think themselves rich, but they're poor. They think themselves well-supplied, but they're destitute. This is the description of a church who has no desire to listen to Jesus and has pushed him outside of the church itself. Christ has to stand at the door and knock. Do you notice what he says? Does he say, see, I'm at the door and knock? He says, behold, I'm at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, the emphasis there is on the word, not on the visual. Christ has to stand at the door and knock, calling to anyone faithful on the other side of the door to open it. It won't be easy to open the door for Christ to come into the Laodicean church. There's opposition. Christ promises a reward to those who overcome, to those who open the door, because there will be some, even in the midst of the church, who will try to prevent the door from opening. In this picture, we see that pictures aren't just cute or harmless or even helpful, but depictions of our God are actively harmful and get in the way of worshiping God as He has revealed Himself in His Word. Any picture of our great, holy, mighty, and triune God will fall short. You know, this last week in uh, family worship, we encouraged us to read Genesis 1, the first couple of chapters of Genesis. And I hope as you read Genesis 1, you noticed that mankind was made in whose image? God. In God's image. So when we make the image of God, do you know what we're doing in the created order of the universe? We're tipping it upside down. When we make God after our imagination, our likeness, no matter how faithful or well-intentioned or hopefully helpful we may intend to be, we distort and twist, twist the truth of reality. 
And that includes Christ Jesus, who was there in the beginning, who was very God, a very God. All right, Jacob, so be it. You convinced me, but I want to see Jesus. I want to see him. Is that really so wrong when I want to see Jesus? No, that's not wrong. That's a good thing, brothers and sisters. Is it burning in you to see Jesus? Are you desirous to see our God face to face? That is a good thing. It is a good thing to desire to be with God and to be in His presence and to see Him. It's something that Moses said he wanted. It's something that the Apostle Paul said he was looking forward to. To see and behold God and to be with Him forever. Never again to be separated. All of Christ's people ultimately go to the place where we will spend eternity with Christ. There will be no faith in me in that day. Did you know our faith has an end? Our faith has an expiration date? Did you know that? We will not need faith in eternity, brothers and sisters. Faith is what we hope for. It is the evidence of things unseen. But then we will see him face to face. A day when we don't need faith. A day when faith has gone by. A day when all that we will experience is forever and eternity with our God, never to be separated again. What a day. As we sing in the hymn, Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumps shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Until that day, we wait. Just like the Old Testament Israelites waited for Moses to come down from the mountain. They had to wait. They were commanded to refrain from making an image of God and using it in worship. Until that great day, we wait as New Testament believers, as people who have only heard of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, we wait for the day when either He returns or He calls us home. We are pilgrims on our way home. And we are waiting to get to see our Lord Jesus. This sentiment is expressed by the Apostle Paul, one who saw Jesus and yet he knew he must wait until he saw him again. He wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Philippians 1.21. He said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live now, I live the life of faith. And when I am called home to be with the Lord, then I shall see him face to face as he truly is. In John 14, Jesus, speaking of his eventual death, resurrection, and ascension, he was speaking to a gathering of people who were there, visibly in front of them. And he said, all of this I've spoken while I'm still with you. But the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You have heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. We now have the Holy Spirit who enables us to live by faith and not by sight. The desire that we have to be with Jesus, to behold Him face to face, that is a good thing. And it's also a good thing that our faith is not eternal. There's an end date on that. A day when we will behold him face to face. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15, in a blink of an eye, in a moment, we shall become as he is. Until we wait, we live as 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. We live by faith, not by sight. We live as Hebrews 11, 1 tells us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. What a day that will be when our faith turns to sight. We rightly say when we speak of our loved ones who have passed on, they have gone to see the Lord. They are in a better place. They now see Him face to face. So let's recap. God commanded that images of Him are not to be made for worship or other purposes. Don't make images of God. We've seen that Jesus is either God, 
and therefore shouldn't be imaged, for he is in God. We've seen that images get in the way of our worship of the true God in spirit and in truth. We've seen that there are consequences and discipline and rebuke that comes down upon those who persist in using images to represent God. We've seen that no matter how good the art is, it ultimately pulls away from the truth of God's word. But the art is only a shallow, lifeless thing compared to our great God. We've seen that making an image of the Creator is a distortion of the created order of the universe. So, what should we do now? Well, God's word has been spoken to us, and so we're left with only two options. We either respond in faith to God's word, or we reject God's word in favor of our own personal preferences. I welcome you this day to bring your questions or concerns to myself or to the diaconate. I implore you, if you've got questions, I'm expecting that today. So if you've got questions, if you've got concerns, bring them forward. Let's chat about them. Bring them up to members of the diaconate if you go. I don't want to talk to Jacob about this. Bring them forward to your diaconate. I implore you, based on the word of God, to act. We must read God's word. And when we do not read God's word, we invite all sorts of problems into our lives. Ignorance is not bliss, and apathy is not a blessing. May God spare us from being that lukewarm church, neither hot or cold. May God spare us from being disgusting before Christ Jesus. It is my hope and my prayer and my expectation that we are a community of believers who are living in faith. And so let us respond in faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this day asking that you would forgive us all of our sins as your word has promised. That you are a God who is gracious and kind and quick to forgive. Lord God, you are good. In the midst of all the darkness, your light shines through. God, would you enable us this week to live by faith and not by sight? Would you grow in us the gift of faith while we are here? And Lord, would you haste the day when our faith turns to sight? We pray all this in Jesus' name.